Hello, oh, welcome to into our fixed up. So today we have this Monroe calculator. This is actually a Monroe Model D, which is not a particularly common one. Um, the styling is very similar to um, the early Monroes, I think, like A through G, um, if they made a Model A. There's some, um, you know, skin information on that, but this is the Model D. Um, this was introduced in 1915, um, and the Model E was 1916, and then the Model F was 1917, 1918, and then the Model G was 1919, and then 1920. And the Model G is the most common of this style. Um, later on in the video, we'll do a, a comparison between this and the Model G, and we can see you know what changed over time, and also a comparison to some other very early Monroes. Because um, you know that's what interests me a lot about these machines as well, not just you know, how they work and stuff like that, but also kind of the evolution that the, the machines took over time. You know, how you back from this up to, you know, an all a full automatic four function calculator and, you know, almost half the size. But anyway, um, so this we're going to take a look at. We're going to clean it up. Um, you can see there's some, it's not too bad. Probably the person that I got this from cleaned it up first. But there's still some dust on these decimal pointers here and some dust down in there. And there's a significant amount of dust on the inside. So I'll take this apart and clean it out and go over the mechanism. And then, like I said, do the comparison between this and the Model G. Um, and already you can see one of the differences here is this. On the Model G and pretty much every model after, I think the Model F as well, this is a... Um, just the metal center and then it's got plastic handles on it versus on this machine it's one nice solid piece. Um, you can see it's either solid brass or it's been brass plated and then chrome plated. Um, not really sure. I don't see anywhere where it's worn through the brass so it may be solid brass. But uh, another difference also is these nice corner pieces here. Um, when we get into the comparison you'll see that the Model G uh, this top plate actually curves down in the front, um, but on this one, it's a sharp edge, so they put these here, I guess, so you don't, you know, cut yourself on the corners of the stamped steel. Um, another early difference we can point out is the uh, carriage comb here on the Model G and the Model F as well. They just have a stamped steel comb with one knob on the carriage. And then that knob, you know, goes to different places in the comb versus here they have a row of pins on the carriage and then holders for the pins. And this piece is different as well. The Model G has a rail here and with the hook that locks onto the rail versus this one, um, the hook, when you activate the machine, the hook goes forward like that to lock it and then releases when you're done. Um, so this machine, for the most part, does work. Uh, you can see I can enter, and it does enter clearly here with everything. Um, the issue, the only thing that we're really going to have to fix is some shipping damage here. We can turn this sideways, and you'll see that the, um, the clearing crank here is bent and won't clear the carriage. So, so I can unbend that, and then we'll make sure that the Carriage clear is fine. We can flip around to the back. So you can see right there it says D858. So this would have been the 858th machine to leave the Monroe factory. The screw is loose, but we'll be taking that out anyway. You can see down there the patent logo. And it looks like they did, did not put the Monroe logo on the back like they did on the later machines. Around to this side, and you can't really see because of the, the carriage is pretty sticky, so I'll have to clean that out as well. See, um, looks pretty similar. Like I said, we'll compare this to the uh, later machines as well. Um, so, there's something else I forgot to mention. This is stuck down, so it's probably either bent or rusty or something. Let's see if we can free that up. It means that this column will won't lock down because this is constantly releasing it. Anyway, uh, so the first thing you do probably is to take the carriage off and 
I'm gonna look in here, you can see, if you can see right here in the corner, it's also stamped with the serial number. D8, D858, I think it says D858. Um, anyway, you can see that this casting here is actually broken. Um, this is supposed to loop around, like see that one over there loops around? This one, the top is broken off. Um, I don't think that's going to cause any issue. The carriage does seem to slide, but I don't want to, you know, lean the carriage back against the stop because it's going to put uh, stress on it and cause that to pop out. It doesn't look like a fresh break. It looks like it's pretty dirty, but like it's been broken for a while and been accumulating dirt. You can, you can see down there all the dirt that's down there that we're going to have to clean out. So, um, these carriages usually come off pretty easy. Around. And there's a screw head right here, and that's just milled into the, not milled, milled, but cut into the end of the axle that the carriage slides on. There's a rail here, and the whole rail actually unscrews from the other end of the carriage, and then it can slide out. You can see it's kind of dirty, so it's probably causing some resistance to sliding here, so we'll get that cleaned up. And actually you can see, because that piece is broken, it just comes right out without having to slide it all the way up. We'll slide it out anyway. You can see the underside of the carriage there, and the clearing drive here. I have to bend this back. We'll set that off to the side. I'm going to tear down. And you can see now, how this is broken out, the whole back of the casting is broken out there. So, like I said, I don't really think it's going to be a problem. Um, so, I'm not really going to worry about it, but just something to take note of. Take these screws out, that one's already loose. It's also pretty loose. Screwdriver is not very good. And this one's loose too. So, all these screws in the back were loose, so they not coming out. Um, the, the logos on this machine do seem to be in fairly decent shape. Um, you can see there's not really any sort of, hardly any scratches on that one. It's still pretty, pretty readable there. I can get these screws out. Yeah, there's probably some on the bottom as well, so let's see if we can stand it up on the side. And okay, that's interesting. So this plate looks like it comes all the way down and around to the middle here, which is definitely different from the later machines where they had a separate back plate and then a separate bottom plate. This machine seems to just use Looks like they've got the back plate coming down around to here, and then the front plate comes down and around. Can't see the whole thing. The front plate comes down and around to here, and the back plate comes down and around to here. So there actually is no bottom plate. They're just using the front and back plate to cover the bottom, which is definitely uh, different from the later ones. Excuse me. Difficult to get out, almost like someone, almost like someone crossed it or something. The threads at the end are messed up. If we can focus, that's interesting. It doesn't really look like anyone's really been in here. Like, I don't see a lot of wear on these screws, really. Like, you know, this machine has been taken apart and put back together a bunch of times, but I have to take these feet off as well. You don't want to be in terrible shape. This one's squashed a little bit. These feet are the same style as the later machines as well, just basically big giant rubber washers.
this is loose, so that comes out, and then this pipe come off, and you can see how much dirt we've got. And yeah, there's the other piece of whoops. It's the other piece that broke off. Um, wasn't really expecting to find that. It's interesting. So, not sure if I really want to. Maybe I can look into gluing it back in. I don't really want to try and brace it or anything. I don't think it's worth that. But maybe I'll try and glue it or something. Just see if we can add a little extra support to the back of the carriage. But it's interesting. You can see all the dirt and the little friendly spider. That might be a hundred years old or something. So I'll hit that off to the side, and actually you can see there's the serial number and the patent plate or sticker. That's just a sticker that's really in excellent shape. All right, and you can see yeah, there's a spring that's broken. That's interesting. Got a broken spring there. Not sure what that's for. We'll have to check that out. Um, you can see this is the carry mechanism back here. It's uh, we're going into this a little bit more, but they actually have like a um, instead of like a full double helix, it's kind of like a swinging helix. So you can see this piece moves. It's not moving the whole thing, but basically they've got a double helix in the first couple pieces here, and then the rest of the pieces. Um, actually swing back and forth so they can swing one way to make one side of the helix or swing the other way to the other side of the helix. So kind of an interesting design. Um, probably the next thing I'll do is take off this front plate. Um, I'm not going to film that because it's going to be me taking out a bunch of screws, but take that off and then we'll get a better look at the insides here. Right, so I got all the screws out of this plate now. Um, the threads on those seem fine, so maybe somebody had taken this back plate off and messed up the that was been putting it back together, but we can put this off now. And again, they got the serial number scratched in there, 858. So you got a little cutout there for the crank handle, so you don't have to take the, um, the carriage shifter handle off to take this panel off, which is a nice feature. You can get a better look at the logo there. So it has a little bit of damage here and there, but um, overall, it's really not bad. Um, for how old it is. So this side here, um, this, these are the the rockers that these, so you can see that, but these rock back and forth to set what digit you want. Be able to see down in there. So take a look at that from the top side. Um, I'm not planning to take the keyboard off this machine because in order to do that you have to pull all the keycaps. Um, which is not very convenient. Um, but we will take this side off to get a better look at that gear train and actually maybe you able to pull the top part of the keyboard as a unit without pulling the keycaps. Maybe we'll look into that. But for now at least I want to get into this side. Um, so you can see they've kind of done what Martin did where this plate here, which is, serves as the case, also serves as the support for some of the internal components. So I'm take it apart like this, but not everything falls apart once I pull this out. So gravity should help get everything together. Um, I don't know if these will have timing marks on the gears. Um, not the, all the Model Gs, which I only have two of them, but both of the Model Gs that I've worked on, I believe had timing marks on the gears. So issue but since this is a significantly older model in terms of the evolution of the models at least I'm not sure if it'll have the same timing marks so get this screw out of the crank as well this should ideally just pop right off Now this should, yep, ooh, this looks nice. This is a lot nicer than the later ones. Look at this. Look at these nice brass gears they have in here. The later ones are all steel gears. This definitely looks a lot cooler. See it there too. 
And this seems to be of a. Under, there's a spring down there, but it doesn't seem to be doing much of anything. So that's interesting. Um, you can see is this. Maybe the keyboard clear there. I'm sure, where my flat spot has to be. Something about wanting to go, maybe because I have it on the side, I'll have to check that out. But yeah, this is, def this is definitely a much nicer looking gear train than later models, anyway. It's pretty cool. Oh, this is not cooperating, but anyway, so yeah, we'll clean this out. Uh, I'll see if I can find out where that spring went, um, and we'll go over exactly how this works. Um, this is the grease actually still feels moist. That's interesting. Usually, it's the grease in these things is completely dried out, but that's so not completely dried out. So that's kind of cool too. Oh. So anyway, I'll do some cleaning here and see if I can figure out where that spring came from. And we'll go from there. It was definitely a much cooler looking gear set than the later machines. Now, as you can see, I've taken this piece off of here. Um, I took that screw out and then carefully slid this out. You can see this piece actually has the shaft that goes to the middle of that gear. Um, as you can also see, there's no timing marks on any of these gears, so and that's why I wanted to uh, leave that gear in there just to make sure everything, everything stays in time. Um, and you can see the issue why this is so loose is the spring is broken. So you can see there's part of the spring stuck in there and then another part of it stuck down there. So that would be why um, this is not working and also this wing seems pretty stiff too like it doesn't want to like it should be loose in here I would think um, otherwise you know it's not going to work so like it's tight in here it won't move so like to me it doesn't seem right it should be loose in there otherwise you know because it's locked it's not providing any spring tension anyway so if I can get that out maybe clean it up and um, see if we can maybe get some spring tension back there. It seems just to be some kind of dampening mechanism. Um, you know, when you rotate this gear, it, because the crank goes here, so power input comes in here, which rotates this gear, which this peg is attached to, so it seems just like some kind of dampening. Um, you know, because if you rotate this, eventually this peg, this peg here is going to hit the side of the hole, so um, I guess I just put the spring in there for some kind of dampening. Um, now another issue you can see is that pretty much all the way around this gear, the top um, of the teeth are kind of worn off. Um, now, if you look at the other gears, they don't seem to have that issue. Like this gear seems fine, and this gear seems fine. So it looks like what was happening was this piece up here has a little metal flap. You see that comes out there? So it looks like that might have been hitting. So if we rotate this around. Yeah, see? So when that comes out, it would possibly hit against those gear teeth there. So um, I believe that's where the spring, the broken spring here, was supposed to go. And it seems like another dampening thing. You can see this gear is loose on the shaft, but it has a little peg on the bottom of it. And that peg will hit against that piece, I guess. You know, if the shaft is it doesn't seem to want to do much of anything. Yeah, see there? See, if I push that in, then the peg comes over, it pushes that out. Um, so I think that spring was just supposed to be some kind of uh, more dampening for this shaft. So I'll see if I can reattach that. Um, probably what I'll do is I'll just bend, you know, one more loop out to make a loop like that. We could focus. Um, on the other end. So we'll probably just do that, see if I can reattach that, and hopefully that will prevent this from contacting the gear. I don't think it's really going to be an issue. As you can see, you know, more than half of the teeth are still fine. Um, it doesn't seem to, you know, cause any meshing issues or anything, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, there's nothing I can really do about it anyway. I don't have the facilities to make a new gear for this, and like I said, it's not, it doesn't seem to be causing any issues, so we're not going to worry about that really. Um, I'm not sure what the deal is with this. Almost like someone's, you know,
driven pegs or something and then they split it there. I'm not quite sure what the deal is with that. It's actually kind of looks like a different material in these other gears too, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I'll see if I can fix this and see what we can do about the spring here. Um, if I can't get any spring tension back on that, I'm not going to really worry about it. It just seems to be providing some dampening and you know, this machine's not going to see like a lot of use or anything. So um, I think it'll work okay even if this doesn't. That's up the mesh there. Um, I think this will be okay even if this doesn't you know provide the dampening that it was designed to. Um, so anyway, over here you can see this is the um, anti reversing mechanism. So basically, as this starts rotating around, which I have to be careful, this is not going to disengage, but as it starts rotating around, you can see this piece here will push this, which will maintain this ratchet. See how it has a little thing there that keeps this ratchet disengaged, but gravity will allow this ratchet to fall down and engage with the teeth there, um, so that way you can't go backwards. Um, that's a pretty basic mechanism. And this is just uh, like a little uh, brake here, I guess, perhaps to prevent I'm not sure what that's for. I'll take that off to clean it up. Um, but I'm not sure why they have this brake here. It doesn't seem like it would really prevent overshoot or anything. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, anyway. So I've got a bunch of cleaning to do down there. So I'll start working on that, cleaning this, and see if I can fix some of this, some of the things that are not right here. Now, so I've taken the keyboard off as an assembly. You can see it over there. Um, and it's pretty nice that you can do that. And they actually give you these nice long shafts with screws on them. So you can actually screw the keyboard back in with this side on. So you just go in through the side there and then you can screw it into the keyboard there with this side of the machine together. So that's nice. Um, so I put the, this side back on. I've cleaned and oiled everything in here. Um, see, it's nice and smooth. And you get an idea of how this works, the principle that it operates on. Um, you can see these things here rock. Uh, one's, that one's loose, but it'll be held in by the keyboard once everything is you know, positioned and everything. But you can see that these are loose and they walk back and forth and the idea is that you can see like this one here pushes a piece over and this piece has five pins in it so when you turn the handle and this shaft rotates these five pins when this is pushed over will engage with this gear and add five to that register position and this other piece has four pins but if we turn the handle here too far, but you can see that they're all different sizes. So there's one that's really long, and then slightly shorter, slightly shorter, and then this little nubbin one here. So depending on how far over this pushes, uh, depends on or determines how many of these teeth will engage with this. So it's kind of like a modified Leibniz wheel principle, where this is similar to the Leibniz wheel with different sized teeth, and you're choosing how many will engage by, you know, with the position here. Um, combined with this, which is just, you know, five or zero. So basically, the way that the keyboard is set up is that, um, you know, if you push one, this will move over so that the longest tooth engages. If you push two, this will move over so that the two longest teeth engages, and so on. Um, if you push five, this will move over so that these five engage. And if you push six, you'll get these five plus the one longest one here, and then if you push nine, it'll be these five plus all of the ones on this one. So you can see they can slide together like that, and then when you turn the handle, you'll get, you know, all nine from both wheels engaging to add nine. Uh, and if you look at the bottom of the keyboard assembly, you can see how that's set up. So you can see like the one key just has a finger, a center finger on this side, so that'll just push the rocker over slightly to engage that one tooth 
and then the two has a slightly steeper angle to push it over farther and so on up to four, and then five has an angle on the other side to push the five rocker over, and then six has this five rocker combined with this one rocker, and then so on all the way up to nine, which has the five rocker combined with the four shaped rocker from the four key. So it's a pretty simple principle. Um, the only other thing to note here on this one is this. This is for clearing. When this thing gets pushed over like that, you can see it pushes this bar, which pushes on oops, which pushes on a set of sorry, I'm turn this. These rockers here, as so you can see this bar has pins in it that push on these rockers, and then those rockers latch into it's really hard to show. But the way the key stems are shaped, there's a detent that when you push the key down, that rocker springs over and latches the key down, and then when that bar gets pushed over, pushes the rockers, all the rockers over, and that releases all the keys in each column. Um, so there's two mechanisms by which that bar can get pushed over, either by this getting pushed over or by this getting pushed over. And this gets pushed over by this piece, so you can see this little finger here will engage with the tooth end of that um, that rod there, and then the clear key screws into this hole down here. So when you push the clear key, it pushes this, it rotates this this way, which pushes that rod over to clear the keyboard, and that's how the clear key works. The other ramp piece is for the auto clear, so. As I rotate the handle here, see this piece coming up that has a little nub on the end of it? As that piece rotates past the top, see now to the top, that's going to hit against that other angled rocker with the, like with the ramped end on it and push it over to auto clear the keyboard. And the reason why it's loose on there is because for subtraction you turn the crank handle the other way. So you can see, this pin here, um, that's what actually rides that, so I can rotate this back and it won't auto clear until the end of the subtraction cycle. So that's why that's loose on there, so um, you know it won't clear the keyboard until yeah, if I go backwards for subtraction, you can see now it's pushing that up. So right there will be the end of the subtraction cycle when it clears the keyboard and then that's how you get your, um, how it can use that same thing for addition and subtraction. It just is free on there and then, you know, as you rotate it's the end of the addition cycle, the end of the subtraction cycle is when it clears. Um, so, um, what we can also take a look at is, these things here are the carry trips. So when a digit in the carriage passes um, nine, or for subtraction, when it passes zero and goes to nine, it'll push this down like that, and that acts as a and that engages with these things back here. So you can see which one is in best view with the camera. This one here. So um, should really be able to see, but basically it extends a little ramp type thing out the bottom, and then as this piece rotates around it'll push this over and then that edge sticking out will engage with the teeth in this gear, the next column and drive the next position forward one position and then you've got these little tabs here that push those back up so see it pop it back up and reset it so um, the interesting thing about this is the how loose they are really, but basically how the way that this works is, so you can see for addition, it comes around and there's your helix, kind of going across up there, and then for subtraction, you'll notice how these ones get stationary, and then, see, now they're the helix for subtraction. So these pieces are actually loose on here, um, there, there's some drag, um, see I can move it here? there's some drag applied by this piece to make them do that helix that basically this provides some drag to, to 
make sure this one is always at its appropriate stop. So, um, like this piece is the last, I think this piece is the last non-rotating one. So there's a peg in here that goes in between a peg, in between two pegs on this piece. So it has a limited range of motion, see? So um, basically this acts so that all of these pieces are held tight against the peg that's driving them so that, you know, they don't float ahead and cause and, you know, miss a uh, carry. So that's basically how they did that. They kind of cheated there a little bit and instead of having, you know, a drum with, you know, two helixes, one for addition, one for subtraction, they only had to do that on the first several of these and then the rest are floating so they can act, they can have one piece that does the same function for addition and subtraction. Uh, so, that's more or less how this works. Uh, I don't know if I explained what basically, I think I did explain the, the mechanism there for the direction ratcheting so that you can't stop my cycle and go backwards. So I cleaned that all up, that seems to be working fine now. Um, initially those pieces were sticky and weren't, you know, because just gravity pulls them into engagement with the, the tooth wheel there. So I cleaned those up so now they, they fall in and engage and that works fine. Um, oiled all of this stuff oiled all of these, um, and so far it seems to be working nice and smoothly. Um, I was doing that before, but now we've got a fresh coat of oil and everything and cleaned, you know, all the dust out of here. There's pretty much dust in there. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up the keyboard assembly um, and oil the moving parts on that. And then I think we'll just have to clean up the carriage and oil that. And I think we're ready to do a demonstration on this. And after that, then we'll take a look at the differences between this and um, the Model G and also, you know, some other um, similar machines like this that are, you can see the pictures of online. So I'll take a look at the differences there. But yeah, um, one of the main differences that I already pointed out was this really uh, cool old style gear set. Yeah, definitely much different. The the Model G just uses uh, steel gears here, and they're not cast like this with the nice spokes in the middle. Um, they just it looks like they you know milled them out of a sheet of steel. So definitely a really cool gear setting here, I think. Um, and like I said, that issue with the teeth right now um, doesn't seem to be causing any problems. And I never forgot to mention this, but I did get that spring back on. Um, I did have to stretch it a little bit. Um, I think that, I'm not sure how much of it broke off, but I did have it to go back on. It was not very easy. Um, but I did manage to get it back on there. You can see how it's holding these two sliding pieces tight against the pin now, so that they're not gonna drop down into that gear anymore um, and cause any more damage. So I'm entirely sure that this is a really stiff spring, so I'm not sure like what kind of damping that would really provide, but um, anyway, it was important to get that back on so that these pieces don't fall down in here and damage that gear anymore. So it's back on now, um, and that should be fine. So yeah, uh, so far so good. So definitely an interesting machine. Alright, so I have this all uh, cleaned up and back together now. Um, you know, dusted the key plate here. Uh, clean up the decimal pointers. Uh, those are just kind of sticky, but these are just, you know, it's kind of hard to grab these little knobs here, but let's flip it over. Like that. So those all look pretty good. And there was a little bit of, you know, paint issues there, but that's fine. You know, this machine is over 100 years old, so um, actually for its age, it looks, you know, pretty good. Also, I can do some calculations here, like one, two, three, four, five, six. And as you can see, that is correct, three, 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 zero. So to clear the counter, you turn this crank forward. To clear the accumulator, you turn it backwards, but you have to lift it up. Oh, I thought, there we go. So we just said, didn't lift it up far enough. 
I think that's the issue there. I'm going to have to something in here. I have to lift this up. Probably lift it up the other way. There we go. See, I just didn't lift it up far enough, that's all. Clear that out. Um, so, for subtraction, it's pretty basic. So you have like 56, we'll add that in. I'm going to subtract 7, you just turn the crank handle backwards. And then you wait for the click. So, um, I should explain this first. On the side here, see there are two little buttons here? There's a button here and a button here. So those indicate your approximate stop points. Now you can see the subtraction one is a little bit lower, but um, that's fine. So basically, you know, this is where the addition cycle starts at this button. So if you turn this around, see how it clicks right as you approach that button? Now for subtraction, you turn it back past that one now in the subtraction cycle, now it clicks right as you approach, let's see, a little bit after that button. So like I said, they're not, you know, exact, but they're approximate, you know, where your cycle started in. So, you know, the addition cycle starts when you pass that button and it ends when you um, get back to that button. And then the subtraction cycle starts at this button or around this button. And then, you know, one full turn back to when you get back to this button. So where the subtraction cycle ends. And then there's basically nothing happening. This is just, you know, free range. Um, and the reason I think that they did that is because of the, um, the double purpose helix um, that I showed earlier in for the carry uh, propagation, carry propagation. Uh, if you remember the, so from about here to like halfway across the machine, showing this from like this side to halfway across it's so regular you know you got your helix for subtraction your helix for addition or vice versa but then from here on is only one helix and it's flexible so it'll you know um, form the subtraction helix when you're in the subtraction cycle and form the addition helix in the addition cycle so I think that we, one of the reasons that they did that was to take up the space that um, basically the free play in that flexible helix, I call it a flexible helix, but um, kind of like a double uh, double purpose helix. So, so I think we can see that actually. So if we lift this up, we can see. Yeah, actually you can almost kind of see it here. So if we look down, you can see here, the helix goes, you know, starts up here and then kind of goes down and then it would continue to the middle point here is where it starts the double helix. So it will continue down and down and then split off and then go down underneath the bottom of the drum. And then of course this one coming up here is for subtraction. <coughs> subtraction. Now if we turn it the other way, you can see now that the helix, which is down under here, has realigned itself to perform for subtraction. You know, I think that's one of the reasons, if not the only reason, why they did that to take up that free play. So like here you're starting with the helix in the subtraction form, and here you're starting with the helix in the addition form. Um, it seems like it's a little bit more crank rotation than it would take to take up all the free play in the helix, but um, I think that's at least one of the reasons why they uh, did that that way. Right, yeah, so we can see if we start the addition cycle, you'll see that it'll start out by rotating this shaft here with the leadness wheels on it. And see now that stopped, and now it would perform the carries, and now it's done. If you go the opposite direction, see now we're now we're at the subtraction button, just about to start the subtraction cycle. So now it's driving the leadness wheels. Now it's done, now it's gonna it will be performing the carries. Now it's done the cycle. Now it's basically your cycle there. It does half the cycle is driving the Leibniz wheels and the other half is for the carry and then the Leibniz wheel shaft stays stationary uh, when it's not being used. You know, well, when in the carry uh, part of the cycle. Um, that uh, stayed pretty much the same all the way up, at least with the Monroe Model K has a similar principle I believe, um, where they only you know rotate this when it's actually being used. Um, but anyway, so this out here and now we can do an um, 
multiplication, so we can shift this out and do something like 625, and then we can multiply that by 625. So we'll enter it six positions here. We'll turn this up so that it doesn't auto clear. Over and do it two. And then we want to do five here. There we go, 30625 is correct. So we can do a division. We'll move this all the way over to the furthermost position. So with that, we can do 355 divided by 113. So because this doesn't have a bell, you're just going to have to watch for a 9 there and stop when you get there. Um, Oops, a little too far. So there we go, we had our overflow, we restored it. Shift over one position. Oops, I messed up, I forgot to clear this before we started. So I'll shift back over here, we'll clear this out, and we'll start again. So after you add in the 355, I forgot to clear the counter. So I'll do that, now that's clear. Now we can go one, one, three, and start these subtractions. All right, overflow, so we'll restore it. Start of the next cycle. Alright, so we're good to go. Shift this over. Um, so it's subtracting again. There's our overflow, so I'll add one back. Shift it over again. So subtractions. There's our overflow, so I'll add one back. Oops, and I already started the addition cycle, so I have to continue through that. And then go back. Okay. All right, there we go. So we'll add one back. And I've already started the issue cycle again. It's kind of hard. There's like no positive stop. So it's, um, I think now we're good to go. It's pretty easy to, when you approach the stop, or not the stop, but the nub for addition, it's pretty easy to actually start the next cycle if you're not careful. So that's why. Keep action and you know, keep starting the next addition cycle, and I have to complete it because you can't go backwards because of that wrap mechanism down in there. Um, but anyway, so that's why I keep um, doing two additions, or why well, I keep doing an extra addition because I actually start the cycle and have to complete it. But anyway, I uh, will continue subtracting here. All right, now I went two minus subtraction cycles, so should be good. Um, sometimes it feels like a little bit stiff. I think that's the way that they've done the detent here. Um, the detent for the intermediate gears, you can see is just that big long spring there. So uh, when you're rotating the wheels, you're actually pushing that spring out of the way. Now I'll show you in the later models, they added um, little wheels on there to give it somewhat less resistance. But I think that's part of the reason why this feels, you know, somewhat rough is because of um, that uh, spring type detent mechanism where you're just, the gear is running directly against the spring and just pushing the spring itself out of the way. Versus in the later ones, they put wheels on the spring so that the gear is already against the wheel and then the wheels are pushing the spring out of the way. I'll show you that in a little bit. But it definitely feels a bit rougher, I think, because of that uh, than the later machines did. But anyway, I should be able to use the tracking. Like you don't get enough momentum, it kind of gets hung up on trying to push past that spring. And that's the end. All right, so let's slide this over here. And there we go, 3.1415929. So that is correct. So that works fine. So, oops, it's been stuck on something here. And I keep not lifting it up high enough. I guess my wheel gear is stuck. There we go. 
not sure what the deal was with that. It seemed like that digit didn't clear all the way. Of course, this has to be. Maybe because I started the next cycle, that's probably why. So that finger might have been already protruding in there. All right, clear this out one more time. Now these machines definitely have a more primitive feel to them, um, especially with having to lift the carriage up like that to clear it. Um, yeah. Definitely feels like a first generation machine, but um, overall I'm pretty satisfied with how this works. Um, like I said, there's a bit of, it does feel a little bit, um, you know, rougher, but I think that's just because of that uh, spring type, uh, the way that they've done that spring mechanism. So let's see if I can demonstrate that. So I'll put in like seven here and watch as I rotate this around, see how it pushes it past the spring there. And I think that's why it feels somewhat rougher because it's just pushing directly against the spring uh, versus the later ones where they put wheels on there to decrease the friction a little bit. But anyway, um, like I said, I'm pretty satisfied with this. Everything seems to work just fine. Um, so let's bring in some other models. Uh, well, only have one other model, but I'll have some pictures of some other ones. And we can do some comparisons um, and see just how these machines advanced. Let me put this back to auto clear. So let's, let's do that. All right, so the Smithsonian seems to be the only people I can find that have uh, some of these Model D machines, or at least um, claim to, we'll go into that in a little bit, Something, something's weird with some of the pictures, but anyway, so this one, they don't know if it's a Model D, um, we can take a look, there are some differences in between this and this one, um, if we go on here to their description, let's see, somewhere they were saying, uh, so yeah, the machine is marked under the center of the back edge, underneath the carriage 20. So usually that's where the serial number is. So is this machine number 20? I don't know. Um, it could be. Um, but like I said, there are some differences. So the first one you'll see is these decimal. Let's move this into. Ooh. There we go. So the first difference you can see are the decimal pointers here. It looks like they have theirs on a slide where there's a little hook on this and you can just slide the whole rail. So that you know these pointers are always the same space apart, and then the whole rail moves for where you want your commas, um, decimal point. Um, so that's different from ours, which has the individual decimal points. You can see there's two there, uh, one there's two there on the counter, but one of them has the tab broken off, and there's two more over there. So you can slide those individual tabs wherever you want. Versus on theirs, you can only slide the uh, whole rail is what it looks like anyway. And you see there's another one down here and then there's a little hook on the end for you to grab and pull. Um, another difference is the shape of the um, clear selector is different. So theirs looks a little bit taller, has a little bit wider hat it looks like than ours which has which is a little bit shorter and fatter and has a somewhat narrower hat. Um, the handle on theirs is a little bit different. Uh, lo looks like theirs is um, longer and skinnier versus this one seems to be a little bit shorter and fatter, but it's kind of hard to tell um, This kind of looks that way to me the difference between that and that Maybe they are the same. I don't know um, They only have this just this one picture here So uh, we can't get you know a closer look at any of this than what we're getting here. You know, we can just zoom in but um, there, That's theirs and This is ours um, actually, it does look different because you can see on there, it looks like the shaft goes all the way through to the end, versus on this one, it's a solid end, so at least that's one difference. Um, another difference you can see is they have bolts, or nuts rather, on the side here, where we just have screws holding that side in. Um, actually, it looks like so. You can see we even have one more here, so we have this one here, which is for the keyboard. So this will allow you to take this out and then there's you know a few more, then you can take the keyboard out without ever taking this side off. Um, which it looks like this one does not have that option. It just has the bolts for the side. So you'd have to, I guess you have to take the side off and then probably the screws for the keyboard are right up against the keyboard frame. 
Um, other differences, you can see that the uh, for one thing, the clear key is in a different place. So there, they have theirs in line with the column clear keys, which is on here. It's moved uh, over and up, which is the same position it was on later machines. So that's one change. And another change is the handles. You can see here the handle is made um, like we have a handle that screws on. Their handle just has a, a, a hole in the end and then is pinned on. So, and it actually looks like the um, kind of the handle edge is on the opposite side. So, on ours, you can see the the handle edge here is on the outside, and the screw goes in the end. Versus on theirs, the handle side is on the inside, and the whole thing it looks like it's tapered pinned to the shaft. And the same thing with the uh, counter handle as well. Um, and then of course the little nubs here are different also. So. Um, other than that, you know, the logo looks to be pretty much the same uh, as far as I can tell. And then the carriage uh, locking mechanism here seems like it would be the same with just these pins. And then you can kind of see the top of the hook there. Like we have this hook here that locks the carriage in place. And then you can see the uh, V-shaped piece there. Like we have that here to hold those pins in place. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this actually is like machine number 20 or whether that 20 they say is stamped on it means something else or what, but um, yeah, this this definitely looks like it's an older machine than what we have simply because, you know, some of the features that this machine has that we have are closer to the later models than what's on this one, like the screw and handles, the position of this, the shape of this, um, all later style, uh, same with the decimal pointers are later style, um, they match the later machines versus this um, is all like, seems to be older stuff that doesn't match any other machine that I know of anyway. Um, so this is one older machine, they have some other machines here, let me pull those up. So this machine they're saying is a Model D, um, if it is it's significantly different than what we have. Um, for example, you can see they here they changed the later, um, you know, two-piece uh, carriage handle versus we have like one piece made of glass. They have the metal piece and then the plastic end pieces that go on it, which is like the later machines. Um, they have different style nubs than we do too. Oops, that's fine. Um, so they have the the later style uh, short nubs. Versus, or not short, but skinny nubs. Versus, we have the nice uh, big dome nubs on the side there. Um, other than that, the handles seem to be pretty much the same. The decimal ponies you can see are the same style that we have. Um, what what I think is weird about this machine, um, which makes me kind of wonder if it actually is a Model D, is that the carriage locking mechanism is the same as what the Model F has, and not what we have. So you can see, if you look closely here, you can see the edge of the comb there. That's what the Model F and the Model G have. And the same thing over here, there's holes in the carriage that the hook actually goes into instead of like what we have, which are pins that stick out of the carriage that the hook slides over top of. So this style over here is closer to what the Model F has um, and not what we have. but if you look at the windows on the carriage, you can see those are like what we have. The rounded and slightly indented, you can see how each window has like an oval indent around it, um, which matches what they have here, but does not match the Model F or later machines. So this could be a Model D, like a very late Model D that they started making some changes on, or it could be a Model E, or it could be a Model F. Um, I don't really know. Um, the reason why I'm suspicious of some of the things that they uh, say, I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but either way, if you look down here, they say this is machine number D1749. So um, that would be you know almost a thousand machines later than this. This is what eight something. This is eight fifty three. Looks like so. 
And this is eight, this is 853 that we have, and this is uh, 1749 what they have. Um, that, there definitely could have been some changes made um, during that uh, production run there. Um, so let's go on to another machine. So this one they claim to be a Model E, but if we take a closer look, I'm kind of suspicious of that. So I've got two machines pulled up here. Um, okay, if we do it this way, that's better. Uh, so, uh, this one you can see is the one that we looked at before where they were not sure if it's a Model D where it's stamped with a number 20. And then this one they claim to be a Model E. But when you look at these, aren't those the same machine? I mean, look at the way that this handle is slightly bent a little bit. See how the handle, like, the crank is kind of bent up a little bit at the end? It looks like the same thing there. I better look on that. I could be wrong, but to me it looks like the same machine. I mean, even the position of the numbers, you can see here, they've got like, um, like nine and then three zeros, or is it two nine and then three zeros, and here you can see they also have nine and then three zeros, and that could be a two there. Um, or could someone have accidentally put pictures of the same machine on two different pages? I don't know. Um, but I am slightly suspicious based on how similar these two machines look, especially this crank being bent the same way. Um, and how it doesn't really fit with this. So this is the Model D. This one should be later, have later features than this. But if you look at the picture, this has the same early features that this one has. So it really doesn't make any sense that they would have, you know, changed from this machine to this machine and then undid all the changes to go back to this machine. Um, and that, that's not counting the Model D that we saw on the Smithsonian earlier that had the later style uh, carriage lock mechanism. So um, that would be even further ahead of this. And it doesn't really make any sense that they would go backwards. Because even look, they have the same uh, nuts on the side here to hold the side on. Um, and the same taper pin handles and everything. So my suspicion is that someone just accidentally put the wrong picture on this page. Um, and that's why this, you know, it looks exactly the same as this machine, but, um, doesn't really make sense that it would be a Model E. Um, I could be wrong, but just, just the way it looks like to me. Uh, you can comment down below if you have any opinion on that, but, um, I don't be able to find a picture of another Model E. This is the only machine I've seen that claims to be a Model E, so if this isn't the Model E, I have no idea what the Model E is. Um, changes they made from the Model D to the Model E. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm suspicious of this. But So basically what we know so far is that the machines probably started out something similar to this. Now there's a picture of another machine that doesn't have a side on it and the U's are exposed. I kind of think that's more of a prototype than something that was marketed, but again, I could be wrong. Um, especially if this actually is machine number 20. Uh, this is probably what they actually came to market with. Um, and then change to this, which, you know, basically the only feature enhancement that I can see is the individual decimal pointers. Everything else just seems to be mostly cosmetic, like the moving of this over, the newer style crank handles, um, the changing from bolts to screws, or from nuts to screws on holding the side on. Um, oh, and there's one other thing. They added these nice... Uh, corners on here because if you see on this machine just like ours the top just is a flat piece of steel so these corners would be pretty sharp but on this one they've added you know uh, softer corners so you don't cut yourself against the side of the machine which is a, a nice feature um, so yeah Model E not really sure about that that makes me kind of suspicious that that's not actually a Model E but um, anyway well, the reason we're using this cheapo tablet is because the iPad actually won't let you have two of the same windows open at the same time. If you have one app in one window, you can't open the same app in another window, which is uh, dumb, but especially because this lets you do it. But anyway, uh, so I don't have a Model F. I'll see if I can find some pictures of a Model F, and we'll do a little comparison there too. So here's the Model F. Um, you can see it's not really that different. Um, from the last Model D that we saw. Interestingly enough, they did move the handle from being over here to over here. 
um, which is weird because the later machines have the same saw handle as this, like the Model G has this kind of handle. So I'm not sure why for the Model F they moved it over to being a little sheet metal hook on that side. That's kind of interesting. Um, again, they have the smaller nubs than what we have. Um, other than that, the clear key is in the same position. Um, obviously, it's got the lighter style handle. The cranks seem to be the same style. Um, and the only other difference is the windows here are square instead of the oval type ones that we have. Not square, or rectangular rather. Um, other than that, you know, from the outside, you can't really tell. Obviously, we can't get a look at the mechanisms of any of these ones because the this museum only has a picture of uh, one machine. Well, for the Model F, there's some other people that have machines, so I can probably show the mechanism of the Model F, but for the Model D that the Smithsonian has, we can't get a look at the mechanism and see you know, how that changed over time because they only have one picture, and that's the picture of the outside of the machine. Um, the Model F, we can take a little, little bit of a look at that mechanism. Let me pull up some pictures there. So, Javis Mechanical Calculator page has some pretty decent pictures. Um, also has some pretty decent information about Monroe as well. So we can see, there we go. So here's the model F that he has. And you can see the difference already with the detent mechanism. So if we zoom in here, you can see how they have the spring and then they have little wheels on the spring so that the, the um, teeth of the gear ride against that little wheel on the spring instead of riding directly against the spring like they do on our Model D. Um, other than that, you know, it has the same kind of type of carriage support in the back here. Um, this whole piece is new. Um, you can see in ours, lift this up. Now all we have is the intermediate wheel shaft and then the big spring in the back versus in the Model F, they've added uh, this whole support piece here that I believe that's just to support the spring as it runs across and these pieces here might provide a little bit of support to the carriage itself. Um, they might rest against maybe the bottom of the shaft here or something. Um, and provide some additional support there possibly. Um, so all that's new in the Model F. We can see and then That's not going to go there. there we go. You can see this is pretty much the same. Let me turn this sideways actually, it might be a little bit better. There we go. Um, same type of helix thing here with the, you know, the pivoting helix. So it does both. So this half of the helix does both addition and subtraction. Uh, so you don't need the double helix all the way across. You can see there the comb that I was talking about. So the carriage on the Model F. Um, See if we have a picture here. There is one. The carriage on the Model F, instead of having a row of pins all the way across like we have, it just has one pin, and then that pin goes into different positions in this comb here. So they kind of like switched it where, like on this one, they just have you know two holders on the machine, and then a row of pins all the way across the carriage. Here they have a row of positions in a comb on the machine, and then just one pin on the carriage. Um, probably makes it a little bit simpler to manufacture because, you know, on this one, each of these pins had to be installed separately. Whereas here, you've only got basically two pieces. This one piece, which may or may not actually be part of the keyboard plate. So if that's stamped as one piece, then actually that would just be, you know, one piece integral with the keyboard plate. So that eliminates that piece entirely, um, you know, from assembly. If this is actually stamped as part of the keyboard plate, and you just have one piece on the carriage for that pin versus, you know, the two pieces here that are screwed on, plus all the pins across the carriage that have to be installed. So that's probably just uh, manufacturing um, efficiency there. We can find anything else here. Uh, I don't think there's any huge differences, although I believe the gear train in the Model F, you can't really get a good view of it here, but the gear train is steel, I believe, and not brass like we have, but you can just see the tops of it here. You can actually see the Slides of the gears, really. Yeah, I don't really see any. Um, yeah, I think that's all we have to show for the Model F. Uh, just 
you know, not massive changes across the lineup, just, you know, um, small changes as they iterated and improved as they went along. Um, so next we'll compare to the Model G. So here's the Model G, and here we can get a little bit better visualization of some of the changes I've been mentioning uh, with the Model um, F like the comb. So you can see there's just a, a comb across the keyboard and then there's that one pin that lots of different, different positions there. Um, so for Model G you can see they made the clear key bigger. Um, they did change the handle on the carriage a little bit. Um, so I believe the Model F has the same kind of handle that this does where it's just, you know, um, the shaft has a flat on one side and then the handle has a, a flat on the inside of its hole. And then so it only goes on one way and then screws in. Versus this one, you can see it looks like they put a little pin through the shaft and then have a V shape in the handle uh, for that to screw on. Now this is, um, I have another Model G which has the older style handle. So I don't think all Model Gs are made this way. I think that that was a change they made during the run of the Model G. So I think some of the earlier Model Gs may have had the same handle as this. Um, well, this is on later Model Gs. Uh, you can see they put some reinforcements. So here, the shafts just, um, you know, ride in the, this, ride in holes in this end plate here. Well, here you can see they made little like bosses to, I guess, gives give the shafts more support. Um, I'm not sure actually if they made the end plate smaller. We can check that. Well, maybe we can. The G has a carriage release, so you can just lift it up. Um, I guess like a little bit maybe. See, maybe these are like a little bit thinner than those, um, but not by a whole lot. Um, if we can get a look down in there at the gear train, so I'm right, get a side look. You can see that these are not brass gears; they're steel gears, so um, they're definitely cooler looking in there than in there. And you can see the serial number is stamped on the inside there. Does that say G thirty eight zero five five? I think something like that. Kind of hard for me to read with the camera in the way. Looks like that, like 38055. Um, whereas this one had the serial number stamped on the back and also has it there and written a couple other places, like it has it there. Um, the Model G has it there and I think it also has it, has it over here too, right? Yeah, also has it, whoops, right there, not even showing it. Um, and here's a better look at that additional spring. So you can see like if I push down a key, you can see how the gear rides in that little wheel on the spring instead of riding directly against the spring like it does in this one. Um, and like I showed, this change happened in the Model F. Uh, they added that. Uh, this one also has a bell. I think the Model F also had a bell. Um, and this one has the carriage rail. So I'm not sure I pointed this out, but like in the Model F, the Model F has the same carriage lock that we saw on the Smithsonian's Model D where there's just a row of holes in the carriage and then the hook goes into those holes to lock it in place. This one has a rail here so you can see the hook stays on top of the rail at all times and it moves up and down so if you lift this up you can see you can only lift it up so far and the hook stops it so if you want to lift the carriage all the way up you have to release the hook and then you can lift it and go all the way back. Um, now something I just noticed now, you can see, um, so this is the style of um, support they have for the carriage rail here, just these two little loops around it. And here, you can see that they're much thicker. So if we get a side view of that, you can see how much thicker this is than that, um, which I'd say is warranted given that this one broke. Um, I was trying to mention, I did find this piece, but this is not all of it. Uh, this is only part of what should be in there. So, um, like I said, I'm not going to worry about it. It seems to work fine as is. Um, you know, it's not like it, it's not like that being missing allows the carriage to move and jam the machine or anything. It seems to be 
you know, perfectly smooth with that missing. So I'm not going to worry about it. It seems to be fine. Um, you know, this machine's not going to be in heavy use, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. But yeah, given that that one worked, I think this is definitely a welcome change. And I think when we looked at the Model F, it had the same style as this. So that's probably a Model F to Model G change, making these uh, supports here thicker. Uh, you can see they also added a baffle up here in the carriage. I'm not sure what that's for, but that's not here in the Model D. Um, and this one also has a bell. I think I mentioned that the Model F has a bell. And there's something also interesting about this too. So watch the Leibniz shaft here as I rotate the handle. You can see how it moves up and down very slightly. So there it's up. Now it dropped back down. Now it comes back up. Now it dropped back down. I can get a better view of that. Maybe from this side. Yeah, you can see it there. See how it comes up and then drops back down? Um, I don't think the Model F had that. I don't really know. Um, but definitely the Model D does not have that. The shaft is fixed in place and does not move. Um, why they did that, I really don't know exactly. Um, but that's definitely a change that they made at some point. I don't think the Model F has it. I think that was a Model G change. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to mention is the item count. So the item count works by, and I'm not sure which one you can see it better. Here, see it there? See there's a little hole in this key? Um, the item count is just a knob attached to a piece of steel that has a pin on the end. So when you push that key down and lock that in place, it just has a pin that goes in that hole and keeps the key from being released. So if you flip it back over, now the key can be released. Um, one difference with that is that this one is kind of like detented. It has a little spring on it, so it either snaps to that position or snaps to that position. Versus this one on the Model D is completely free to just spin around however you want it to. So we can hit the front of the key, or we can spin around to the back of the key. I think it only works in the back of the key. Yeah, if we spin it on to the front of the key, I think the pin's only on one side, so yeah, that won't work. So, I imagine that would be kind of confusing because it has a little arrow pointed on it. You can see there's a little arrow on the top of it there. But if you have the arrow pointed directly at the key, that's the wrong way. If you have it pointed directly at the key, see that's the wrong way and it clears anyway. You have to have it pointed you know, rotate all the way around, and then it kind of points diagonally, and then that's the right way to have it work. Make sure I'm showing that. So it kind of points diagonally, and then that's the right way to make it work. Um, yeah, you see that kind of being confusing. Um, and here they made it clear by, you can only turn it this way, or point it up, or that way, and it points directly at the key. That's definitely a, a clearer operation there. Um, also, you can see here, how this is rounded down on the front versus the Model D just has a sharp edge on the front. Um, and then when they did that, they got rid of the um, fancy corners here because you don't really need them anymore. They got rid of the sharp corner by holding it down. I believe the Model F also had that change to fold the front down instead of having the fancy corners. Um, so I know this hasn't been exactly the best comparison. It's kind of been a little all over the place, but I just wanted to kind of point out some of the differences that I noticed between the different models here. Um, like I said, I, we don't really know what the Model E would be. Um, because, I, like I said, I don't think the picture that they have on the Smithsonian is actually of the Model E. I think someone put the wrong picture there. Um, but, anyway. So, I just wanted to point out, um, especially because these machines are, you know, not particularly common. I kind of wanted to go over some of the differences that I've noticed and you know, any of the collectors that were curious about what the Model D was and how it was built and different stuff. Well, now there's some information that you can see here in this video to give you a clue. So, um, let's see where I put my tablet here. We'll go over a little bit. You can see on a Japs page down at the bottom. Uh, let's see, you go down here. Yeah, serial numbers. Yeah, so here he has some serial numbers. And he's saying that the Model D is 1914, 1915. But 
Um, he's not sure if it's D1000. Well, now we know that at least it was 843 or whatever this one is. I keep forgetting the number. 853. So, now, now we know that the Model D started before 1000. Um, how much before, we don't know. But, you know, just uh, another piece of the puzzle here. And you know, I'll kind of went over all the different interesting features of this one to give people an idea of what Model D actually is. But anyway, so I think that's going to be about it for this one. I'm um, pretty satisfied with how this came out. It's really in, in you know, excellent shape, you know, except for this little mark on the front. But even the rest of the logo, you can see, is a much better shape than the one on the Model G. You can see this one looks you know, pretty sad in comparison. It's kind of one a bunch of different places. Um, which is this one, so looks, you know, pretty good actually, but, so yeah, that's going to be all it for this, I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.